Hello, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our Dane Protects Data Center Lightning Protection Voice of Experts Interactive Webinar. Welcome. What's really uh, exciting about this is that we have an opportunity to work directly with the audience and get your feedback in real time as we're walking through our material. So I'd like to introduce myself, Mark Hendricks, and my colleague, Stephen Weber, who's running the, the back office side of the webinar. Welcome, Stephen. Hello, everybody. Thank you. So Dane, uh, been in business 110 years. We literally wrote the Red Book on lightning protection concepts. So our intent today is to walk through the concepts of lightning protection with a special with a special focus on how this applies to the very the very critical data center uh, type structures the data center applications so as part of our uh, session as i promised we have some polling questions and i'd like to i'd like to get a feel for the audience so why are you here? Why are you here in this lightning protection webinar? I'm going to let Stephen take over for a moment and he'll present the polling questions and we'll walk through the questions. Uh, and then we ask that uh, each of the audience members select an answer. So Stephen, fire away and show us the polling mechanism. Sorry, Mark, uh, I, I think uh, you should go ahead with the rest of the presentation. For some reason, okay. uh, the polling questions do not want to launch. Um, I'm afraid of that. That's too bad. Well, we'll give the audience a chance to look at those answers. Uh, it may also be possible if you, if you uh, can help us with the audience participation. If you simply type this in as your answer for the first polling question, uh, that will certainly work for the time being. Uh, then we'll see these uh, answers show up and then we can evaluate that as we move forward. So let me move to the next question. We wanted to ask the, the audience. We actually want your your in, your information. What what constitutes the biggest loss at a data center from fire? Is it is it the lost revenue that really that really uh, hurts? Is it the public image? and tarnished branding that your data center for a large brand name uh, business has suffered a, a damage of this nature that would somehow tarnish your, your brand image as well? Is it the environmental pollution? Of course, uh, fires are always a, a, a big mess and this would uh, give us additional motivation. Is it the loss to your customer? Is it that they are losing their data and their, and their uh, and their business? Or is it the, the physical loss of the information technology employee jobs? And this, this helps us understand the motivation of the customer. If, if one of these is more important for you, we'd appreciate that you can type that into your uh, question screen as uh, Stephen's fighting with the polling question still. I'd like to move on to the next question. And that is, what is the functional area that must be protected from lightning induced ground potential rise? So the, the point of this is if the side of the building gets struck by lightning, the lightning currents travel into the earth and induce a large ground swell into the, the soils and into the structure. So what's the functional area that needs to be protected? Is it the main incoming feed? Is that seem most important to you? Is it after the backup generator transfer switch? Is it the fire control systems that need to be protected from this uh, lightning effect? Is it the chiller plants? Or is it the isolated grounding systems for the server racks that, that experience this large ground swell? And the reason this question is important to us is that we wanna get an understanding of the value that you place on your data center assets. So, 
Unfortunately, we, the polling question is not working correctly as we as we want today, so we'll move on. So lightning formation. This is a nice uh, illustration that shows that moment right when the the actual lightning has attached to some portion of a building and is now uh, in what's considered the, the the formal discharge of the lightning event, the, the final stroke. But what's interesting about this illustration is is the fact that it shows the step leaders trying to attach to other buildings, and these. This is what's actually occurring from that voltage that's induced by the charge in the air at that moment when the lightning is striking. It's, it's creating this huge electric potential that's drawing these step leaders from other associated buildings relative to their distance to that charge. And what's really nice is a photograph that I first saw from the National, uh, uh, National Geographic and it, depicts lightning striking a sycamore tree. And that's a really good reminder to not stand under trees during a lightning storm. But what's actually captured on this image are those streamers that are trying to attach to the charge, but didn't form the main channel. But what's important here is you can see that that, that streamer still struck part of the structure of that house that they in this case it was actually the tv antennas and in this case it's described in the article it blew apart the tvs in the house and, and started some fire within the house and it wasn't even the main stroke so what's important is that it it demonstrates that step leader that final jump that lightning wants to impose and that final jump is a, a real key part of what's considered the rolling sphere uh, theory of, of lightning and the formation of this the step leader and the final attachment that final downward leader has what's considered a striking distance and it actually leads us to another polling question i'd like to ask the audience what does that rolling sphere radius represent is this the theoretical attachment point for a step leader is it the distance a step leader can jump is it the coverage calculation over a structure? So the, the point of this question is to get an understanding of, of you, the audience. What do you think that is? And in, in fact, it's, it's actually part of each of these answers is actually fairly accurate. They're the, it is, in fact, the theoretical attachment point that you will get if you are uh, subject to the lightning strike. It is the distance that the step leader can jump just before it, it attaches. And it, uh, and it is a very nice way to show the illustration of the coverage calculation of the structure. So lightning protection starts with risk management. What's really important is to understand the risk to your structure. And the IEC methods give us a really good uh, calculation uh, set of uh, protocols. Uh, NFPA 780 also has a, a lightning risk evaluation. There are some software tools available. Uh, in this case, I'm illustrating the GAIN IEC 62305 risk tool. And what's what's really nice about the tool is it it acts almost like a expert uh, an expert evaluation, an expert interview process and you essentially build a model of your structure and you build a model that shows the risk if you did nothing and that's what's illustrated here across the top in red if you do nothing and this is just a typical model if you do nothing you have risk of loss of life you have risk of of service to the public uh, you have risk of economic value and What's important is when you apply lightning protection measures, you can reduce the risk below a tolerable threshold. And you want to be efficient. And so what, what, what's really nice about our risk analysis tool is it allows you to select various measures. And if you select what's called the LPS-1, it's the highest class of lightning protection. It, it, 
it translates to more effective interception of lightning. And what that means is that it controls the risk to a very low threshold. And if you apply less stringent means like the L class LPS three, it basically allows for slightly higher risk to still be incurred. In other words, fewer lightning rods translates to a slightly lower attachment efficiency. So this was sort of a trick question that we wanted to ask our audience. We wanna understand what your motivations are like. And there may be the belief that lightning protection is not required. So external lightning protection system is not required because, and this is some things we've heard. So I wanted to see what our audience thinks today. The lightning protection system attracts lightning to my building. The lightning protection is too expensive to apply. It's not worth it. I already have a surge protector on my AC power, so I don't need the external lightning protection. Or perhaps it's simply because the LPS is not in the pro uh, project specification for your data center building. And then of course the answer, it is in fact required for my building. And, and the, the intent here is to get an understanding of what our audience feels about this topic. And the, the, the point is that we can have a discussion about any one of these points. And, you know, for instance, lightning protection system does not actually attract lightning. The building was going to be struck anyway. The lightning protection system gives it an efficient attachment point so it doesn't otherwise attach randomly to the structure. So this is this is the, the follow-up for the risk analysis. After you select your measures, the risk analysis will tell you that you need a certain class of protection to reduce your risk below a tolerable threshold. But what that does is it affects the both the air terminal placement because you'll need more rods to attach to a smaller lightning stroke. It turns out that the lightning, that, that last step leader is a function of the current and a lower current level can jump a shorter distance. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, factor of the current. And it turns out that there's sort of a minimum amount of charge and current that's required for lightning to strike in the first place. So keep in mind, lightning charge is traveling miles and miles through the air. So it takes quite a bit of charge to punch through the dielectric breakdown of air in the first place. And that final step leader, that distance it wants to jump is a, factor of this current that's in the stroke. So a small lightning stroke jumps a small distance and a big lightning stroke can jump a larger distance. So when we're dealing with the, the likelihood of a strike, LPL level one is the most uh, risk control. And so basically what that translates to is you'll have more lightning rods. So a lightning protection system functions on basically five principles, and we call it the pillars of lightning protection. But it's the principles that you would install an air termination system, such as what Ben Franklin pictured in 1750. He developed the first lightning rod, the first down conductor, and the first earthing. And basically that's what he discovered is that if you if you put up a lightning rod, you will not get a random stroke onto any part of the building. The lightning rod serves as a higher point closer to the charge in the clouds, and it gives it a preferred spot to strike where it would otherwise be random. But in addition to those first three principles, we also need to pay attention to separation distance. And that is the distance from the down conductor to any other metal de devices and structures within your within your building. So you've got a chiller on your roof and you don't want to attach lightning directly to the chiller. You want to be separate from the chiller. And then there's lightning equipotential bonding. Basically everything metal needs to be bonded to itself within a larger structure so that you do not have uncontrolled voltages. So each of these functions is important and they all have to be understood simultaneously as you develop a lightning protection system. 
So here's another polling question that we thought is an interesting topic. How does lightning induce surges? It is direct coupling of the stripe delivering charge into a wire. Is it the electromagnetic induced current from the plasma channel into adjacent wires through magnetic effects? Is it the ground potential rise that provokes a voltage in your AC power line to ground, which drives the surge currents? This is interesting to us because we wanna get an understanding of what our audience believes is the, is the actual mechanism for lightning strike. It turns out that surges are induced from all these types, and there's actually you know, other mechanisms as well, but these all are part of what induces surges. There's also static. There's also the, just the plain electric field from the cloud itself. But these are all mechanisms that drive surge. And so when we're talking about lightning and surge protection, we actually have to protect against each of these types of of mechanisms. And that's, again, back to the principles, the, the pillars of lightning protection help us deal with each of these mechanisms in a, in a different way. So air terminal placement to provide preferred attachment point to prevent lightning striking randomly directly into your rooftop equipment. So here are some nice uh, illustrations that show the, the modeling of a lightning protection system. And here we see the air terminals placed strategically around the corners of the building. And the intent is that it gives lightning a, a preferred attachment point based on the rolling sphere step leader distance. So we know that the charge might float above this structure at some you know, number of feet in the air momentarily, right before it strikes. And that step leader attachment distance is what's depicted in the blue coverage model below. And basically that's showing that everything below the, the, the theoretical coverage model is actually protected from that direct strike. And then what's critical is that the air terminal placement, the down conductor placement, and the earthing termination system are all effectively integrated together. What's nice about this illustration is it shows us a lightning protection system that's been installed around a data center structure. And you can see that it, it's composed of a combination of equipotential bonded metal to metal air terminals around the roof of the building, but also a combination with isolated terminals around the periphery in some of these structures around the peripheral of the building. And what that creates is a very clean and efficient lightning protection system. So here's a nice illustration showing that rolling sphere concept. The charge is momentarily uh, treated like a, think of it like a ball of, uh, and the electric field provokes a, a spherical uh, step leader attachment. And what it wants to do is attached to our air terminals. And so if you roll the ball over the structure, you can simulate what that coverage model looks like, almost like the, the canvas of a tent canopy. And if you're below the canopy, you are safe from that direct strike effect. And what's nice about this particular system, as I mentioned, it's a combination of equipotential bonded air terminals and these isolated masts that keep the lightning from injecting into the structure. So we put a lot of energy into putting up air terminals and having down conductors and having a well-designed earth termination system, but what about that flashover? And this is that concept of separation distance. If, you're, if your lightning rod is too close to the electrical wiring, it will flash into that electrical wiring. So if you pay attention to all five of the, the aspects of the pillars of lightning protection, you can control all these mechanisms. So here's a nice uh, illustration, a nice photograph showing a down conductor running just immediately adjacent to a lighting and a outdoor sensors. And you can see that that distance, that separation distance, and then 
the NFPA 780 uh, references, it's called bonding distance. But basically what it shows us is that you can calculate how far away that needs to be. And if it's too close, you have to bond. Otherwise it's gonna flash anyway. And so that's the point about equipotential bonding. It controls what otherwise would be a side flash. So we're gonna talk about the earth termination system. How far apart should earth rods be placed? And this is often a, a very, a very interesting conversation that, that uh, comes up, but um, I'm interested in what the audience understands about the, the topic. So should it be the depth of the rod is equal to the space that you should put them apart? Should it just be a standard 20 feet? Should it be six meters? Should it be less than 20 feet? Well, it turns out that the best practice is generally the depth of the rod is the space between them. And what you see is that if the rods are spaced too close, you're actually influencing each other and they become less effective. So there's, there's a, a lot of you know, mathematical calculations behind developing a proper earth system. So what's really uh, effective about the IEC 62305-3 standard is it gives us really good guidelines on earth rod design, earth termination system. So there's what's considered a type A, which is essentially an isolated earth rod that is connected to your down conductor. And it may or may not be connected to other earth rods around it. That's called the type A. The type B is what's considered a ring electrode. And it looks more like a ring with uh, also with vertical or uh, vertical buried earth rods. It can also be embedded in the foundation of the, the concrete. So you'll have an opportunity to, to construct these types of earth electrodes. So something like a data center is going to probably look like a type B uh, ring earth electrode. So here's a good question for our audience today. How often are you encountering grounding or bonding issues? Is it something like a couple of times a year or less? Is it between two to 10 times per year? Or is it even more than 10 times per year? So I'm down here in Fort Pierce, Florida. We get a lot of lightning. So we're gonna see grounding and bonding issues more often and because the lightning will provoke problems if you if you have poor bonding and grounding so i'm just really curious about this from the from the audience point of view are you encountering a lot of grounding and bonding issues so i'd appreciate again appreciate if the audience can simply type in a, a a question as to how often you think you're encountering these types of issues so we took we took a lot of effort to talk about the risk analysis the risk analysis helped us develop which class and calculate which class of lightning protection will reduce your risk sufficiently below a tolerable threshold. Once you've selected the class of lightning, you now can design an air termination system based on the, that, that suggested step leader distance. And again, the, the class one, which is more, uh, more lightning rods, is also translates into more earthing. So a class one system, which, which may be uh, what you need for your very critical data center application, the class one lightning protection system also invokes a class one earthing system. The class one earthing system basically implies that depending on your soil resistivity, you will need more buried earthing conductor. And what this chart shows you is if you know your soil conductivity, your soil resistivity, then you can calculate the length of buried earthing system that you need for that lightning protection system. So here we so show a couple of nice photographs measuring the soil earth resistivity, measuring the loops and troubleshooting and, and determining that the earthing system is actually installed and, and implemented correctly. But again, what's nice is that the IEC methods give you a way to customize your air termination and your earthing system to meet the requirements that you've selected to reduce your risk. So from what type of equipment 
should down conductor separation be maintained? So should it be maintained from separation distance from neighboring buildings? Is it from trees? Is it from conductive parts? Is it the roof mounted structures? Is it the interior installations? Well, it turns out it's actually all of these things. The separation distance of your down conductor needs to be especially separate from your other conductive parts, certainly separate from your roof mount chillers and your roof mount compressor structures, and definitely separated from the interior installations that you don't even see from the outside of your structure. And this is why separation distance is so critical to, to be understood and worked into your lightning protection system design because of those hidden interior installations. And in something like a data center, this is this is in fact your most critical assets. So the separation distance calculations look something like this. We can we understand the height of the building, we understand the current that is injected into this into the the lightning protection system. And so we can run a calculation that looks like this. Separation distance according to the IEC calculation, IEC 6 to 305 looks like this. It turns out that it is mathematically the same, approximately the same uh, value you get when you run the NFPA 780 bonding distance. And that is because naturally the, the IEC and the NFPA methods are reasonably well harmonized. So this calculation that we do for separation and bonding distance is similar. You'll get a similar value based on the, the height of your structures. And so what that calculation allows you to do is to calculate how far apart, in this case, you can see it's approximately 52 millimeters, but how far apart you need to be from anything around you. So this is what's really uh, nice about the, the IC standards. It gives you a really good, clean mechanism for calculating separation distance. And this is what guides you in your air terminal placement and your down conductor arrangements. So here's a couple of nice uh, photographs of separation distance gone wrong. Here we have an air terminal, and it's an isolated type of a terminal on a freestanding mast, and then it goes into an equipotential bonded system. But notice that it's immediately adjacent to a control box on the top of this data center. And what's really important is that you've now got a air, the air terminal and the down conductor system that's within the separation distance, which means it's going to side flash. So we do all this trouble to put up these air terminals and we've missed the opportunity to avoid side flash. So again, you're, you're, you need to pay attention to all the pillars of lightning protection. Here's a couple of nice air terminal illustrations, photographs that show the air terminals placed around the roof of a data center and you can see that it's very uh, effective at providing the coverage that you need for the structure at the same time as providing placement to avoid that side flash danger. Here are some nice photographs showing the air terminals placed around and above the chillers on a sensitive data center structure. And you, you can see that the, that the chillers are, are up on the roof, they're metal structures. You want to place your air terminals in a manner to not inject current directly into these chiller structures. You lose your chiller at a data center, you lose your data center. So you can see that this is that this is a, a, a terribly important aspect. So want to move on to what's considered the fifth pillar of lightning protection, which is equipotential bonding. So what's nice about an illustration like this is it shows you all of your bonding of your internal rebar structures. It shows you the equipotential bonding of that raised floor in your data center. It shows you the equipotential bonding of your air terminals to the metal structures, but also separate from your chillers and your other rooftop structures, your control cabinets. And this is what the potential bonding looks like for the metal to metal parts.
But what does a surge protector do? The surge protector serves as a potential bonding to control the voltage. So you can't bond direct, but you can bond indirectly. So here's all that earth termination system. You can see it's the, the grounding mechanisms. You can see a dedicated uh, conductor in with the rebar clamps. You can see good metal to metal bonds between all of the rebar. And what's important here is that if there is a lightning strike to this building, equipotential bonding shows that you'll have everybody rise and everybody fall together. You won't have sparking between dissimilar metals areas. You won't have sparking within the concrete where it'll spall the concrete. And over time you'll have now, now you have rust and you'll degrade your entire foundation, for instance. So that's what's really important is the connection of that reinforcement mesh to reduce sparking and touch step voltages within your structure. <clears throat> so why does a building with an external lightning protection system also require internal lightning protection system? And when we say internal lightning protection system, we're meaning things like your surge protection devices. So why does it? Well, internal lightning protection protects the electric and electronic installations. It's required for lightning protection equipotential bonding. Or is it required because of the internal lightning protection prevents surges in the power grid? Well, it's essentially all three. These are all right answers. It just depends what's most important for you. So this was why these polling questions are interesting for us because we want to understand what's more important to the users and the audience. So I've got another question for you. Surge protection provides. Okay, this is essentially, again, I, I, I have these answers, trick questions, right? Equipotential bonding from electrical wires to ground. It provides voltage control between wires to ground. It provides a surge current path to ground. It provides transparent operation of electrical circuits with a voltage relief during transient events. Or is it that it's no value if it's not installed? Well, it, in fact, it does all, all of these things. All of these are actually true answers. And the point is, that's what surge protection does. It actually controls the voltage between a wire to ground during a transient event. And like a pressure relief valve on a water heater, if the water pressure builds too much, it will essentially relief some pressure. Well, that's what the, the transient surge protector does, is it acts as this, this voltage relief, this voltage control. Otherwise, the voltage builds up between a wire to earth until you lose the dielectric of the wire, you lose the uh, electronic equipment, you have a source of fire in your data center. <laughs> so we're looking at our building again, you have your equipotential bonding, and now what's really important is that we apply surge protection devices at the point of use of the sensitive equipment within your data center. So what's really important here is that you can see that you're protecting the AC power relative to the earthing system, and you're protecting the data line relative to the, surge, to the earthing system. And so this is what you would see at a camera, uh, security system you'll see this in something that looks like your fire control system where you have remote sensors throughout the building uh, you'll see it at your security panels where you have uh, intrusion alarms throughout the the building so what's important here is that you can see that the surge protector is providing voltage control for wires where you cannot equipotential bond directly you cannot bond your AC power directly to earth. You bond it through a surge protector to control the voltage to a tolerable level. So data centers have a very critical host of surge protection applications. It's important to apply the surge protection devices directly at your main distribution, directly at the point of use at the distribution panels for the server racks, it's critical at the power backup generators and at that transfer switch. 
So if you lose your main line, you have your N plus one type uh, backup systems for, for power at your data center. It's critical at the chiller power feeds up on the top of the roof. You lose your chiller, you lose your data center. It's of course, it's critical on the DC power side of the power buses that feed the, the individual server blades. It's also critical at your low voltage control systems. As I mentioned, your door accesses, your intrusion alarms. It's critical on your fire alarm systems. So you, your fire uh, prevention and your fire mitigation control systems cannot function correctly if the sensors are not working correctly. And it's also critical on your power over ethernet security cameras and switches. So all of these types of applications will show up somewhere on your electrical line diagrams. And what's important is to go through your diagrams and discover, do I have surge protection devices at these critical points within my distribution system? Here's a couple of nice photographs of what are the surge protection devices up on the uh, on chiller type compressors. And what's important is that it's because it's subject to such high uh, surge energies that it's a IEC type one and type two type hybrid device. And what's really critical is to also control the voltages on the IO data lines that are, that are monitoring the chillers and the pumps and compressors. So that's what you see in a photograph like this where we have the AC power surge protection and the low voltage IO for things like the, the routing for uh, the control lines for these types of pumps. So we talked a little bit about that fire suppression, fire extinguishing systems. And it's just sort of ironic that fire protection needs to be protected because if you lose your control systems and your AC power at your, at your fire uh, extinguishing panels, you'll lose that capability to protect your building. So we have a, another polling question. We'd like to get the audience's feel for what's considered uh, field instrumentation type uh, control wiring. That will be, this is very common within a data center application where you have uh, control lines going be, you know, in and around the, the structure. And this is a really common question that I get. What side, which end of the twisted pair should be bonded? In other words, which end of the pair, twisted pair shield should actually be bonded to the earthing system? And I get customers that think they should bond both sides, and that can be troublesome if your grounding systems are uh, not uh, consistent. So if you're going from a data center side of your building over to a, some other, uh, maybe it's a guard shack that's out at the front entrance of your structure, these bonding systems, may, the earthing system may not be the same. And if you bond at both ends, you can have a loop. What we see very common is that the field instrument, the more remote side, say at the guard shack, is the the uh, is actually where the bond is. And then the cabinet PLC side shows a indirect bond with the surge protection device, with the gas tube. And that allows voltages that do build up to be to be extinguished. So this was an interesting question that I get a lot. And I'm, again, we're, we're interested to understand how the audience, uh, the impression. And if you feel appropriate, if you can enter that into the chat room, we'll, we'll be able to see your answers. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about what's considered isolated air terminals and separate earth references. So this is not necessarily a data center. You can see this is a launch complex from uh, out at the Cape Canaveral. And what you see in this photograph from Google Earth is isolated air terminals around the launch vehicle asset. And so what you see here is an air terminal that is going to serve as an air terminal attachment for the lightning that wants to otherwise strike randomly it will see the air terminals as a preferred attachment point, strike the air terminal, divert the current into the earth into an earthing system. 
And what's important here is that you see that this is a method employed by our friends at NASA. This is also very commonly employed at things like a data center application where you want to keep that lightning current completely away from your asset. And we have other customers that have a very you know, critical type uh, application such as this. And you know, the, the best way to, to avoid a hazard is to eliminate it completely. And that's what we do with an isolated air termination system is that it, it gives you lightning protection without injecting any of these currents, without any side flash risk into your asset. And the IEC 62305 uh, gives you really good guidelines on applications of this. Uh, NFPA 780 also shows um, very similar uh, isolated air terminal uh, arrangements of this manner. And as I pointed out, this is what the very clever people at NASA incorporate. And this is a very common and widely used isolated type system. And of course, you scale it down for your building structure, but you get the same concepts. So isolated lightning protection system prevents side flash from down conductors into adjacent structures. Does it prevent ground potential rise into the master ground bar from nearby earth rods? Does it prevent ignition sources caused by sparks between unbonded metal surfaces? Well, it does all three. And again, we were interested in seeing what the what our audience and what our customers feel is the most important aspect. And but what, as I pointed out, the isolated lightning protection actually gives you all these advantages because it eliminates the, the, the lightning currents from entering any part of your structure. So questions for the, from the audience. Apologize in advance that our, uh, again, that our polling question mechanism was uh, giving us technical difficulties today. Um, but what we covered today, we discussed data center protection. We looked at the, the step leader attachment. We talked about how that provoked steps leaders to introduce the rolling sphere concept. The rolling sphere being the, the theoretical distance that lightning will jump at the last final step leader attachment. We talked about the five pillars of lightning protection and including SPDs, which are equipotential bonding where you cannot otherwise directly bond like an AC power or a data line. Uh, note to the attendees that our session today actually is uh, qualifies as a one hour uh, workshop. Uh, we did include questions, which gives us the ability to evaluate and understand that you uh, understand our, our concepts today. Uh, you can see our Florida Board of Professional Engineers provider number and our license for uh, qualifying as uh, continuing ed units if our audience needs this. And that uh, is the conclusion of our session today. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Stephen, did uh, some of our attendees have some questions for us today? Mark, you hear me? I can, yeah. sir. Yes, just once again, apologies for the polling mechanism not working. I'm not so sure how I'm not sure what went wrong there. We have one question regarding surge protection devices. Um, uh, the person asks, um, if you install surge protection devices in the main incoming DEC panel, um, do you need to distribute surge protection devices throughout the data center as well? Well, the, the rule of thumb from the IEC standards is every 10 meters, if, if, you're, if your surge protection device at the panel is farther than 10 meters away to the victim, it's entirely possible that you'll still have surge energy out at the victim. And so the answer is yes, you will need to apply surge protection at the main distribution panel and at um, the subsequent downstream sub panels. Uh, th there's a, a lot of information available about coordinating surge protection devices where you put a, a very heavy, uh, what we would consider a very robust device at the main incoming panel but then you have to pay particular attention to the coordination with other devices throughout the system. And it's part of that answer is also, you need to pay a lot of attention to all of the other control wiring. 
and not just the AC power, but all of your low voltage circuits as well. I think that gives us a good answer for it. Yes, yes, thanks Mark. And then we have a question about grounding. What is the acceptable grounding measurement for the grounding system? In other words, in ohm values. So it's, it, uh, certain, certain industries have their own you know, standards and things. I have, we have customers in the power industry that have one ohm requirement. Uh, I, I work a lot with uh, customers in the first responder business that have a five ohm requirement for their earthing. Uh, the National Electric Code for residential structures is 25 ohms. So it uh, it's not that it's all over the, bat, the map, but basically the more critical your application, the lower you will want your uh, earthing rod uh, resistivity. Um, and again, the, the IEC methods give you a really good uh, mechanism to design an earthing system to give you sufficient uh, length of buried conductor in the soil. Stephen, do you have any other things you'd like to add to that? No, that's it. Thank you, Mark. We have a question about spatial shielding. Is spatial shielding for a data center an important aspect, again, to protect against lightning electromagnetic impulse? Absolutely. The The actual construction of the, of the building will likely include the mesh type um, earthing and bonding mechanisms in the rebar as I as I had in some of our illustrations. And it will further reduce the influence of electromagnetic effects from nearby lightning strikes. But also with that, you know, shielding and bonding, you get echo potential bonding and reduced touch step voltage from those same lightning effects. So you know, when when done in a thorough and uh, integrated system, you'll 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 benefit m several ways from the t same types of of shielding uh, mechanisms. Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, that's it for the questions. Um, if you guys have any more questions, be please feel free to send it to my email address. You'll also have it in the registration emails, and uh, we'll get back to you. Thank you for for the webinar, Mark. Thank you. And uh, again, we'll uh, keep posted and we'll be conducting further webinars in the future. You can always reach out to us directly. We can answer specific questions. Uh, thanks for everybody's uh, attention and uh, appreciate the attendance today. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you.